this is chapter one. We're going to start looking uh, at microbiology. What is the field of microbiology? And before we do that, we're going to look at a brief history of microbiology. Look how it has progressed to where it is now today. We're going to start with Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. He is uh, considered as the father of microbiology. He was a Dutchman, and he made his own microscopes because uh, excuse me, back in the 1600s when he lived, you obviously could not exactly go to Amazon and, and buy one. Uh, so he made very simple, they were very crude microscopes, but they were able to magnify to some degree. And uh, he looked at his surroundings. He was a very curious man. He started off by looking at water and was like, oh my goodness, there's little things in here. And he referred to them as little animalcules. Sometimes he referred to them as little wee beasties that were present in, in the water. Uh, he progressed from there to looking at uh, basically anything that was around him. He was just a very curious man. And was like, let me see what's in this sample. And he was a tailor by trade. So he was not trained in the sciences and never really studied the sciences. He was just a very curious man. So initially, like I said, he looked at water samples from his sister. And, and then he progressed from there. Uh, I actually have a book that has some of his papers translated. And one of them was kind of interesting because it talked about how he was, he was curious about well, what's in his mouth. So he, he scraped his teeth and took those scrapings and looked at them under the microscope. And sure enough, he found some of those little animalcules there. And then he, like I said, was a curious man. So then he started thinking, well, I wonder if what's in my mouth, is that the same as what's in my buddy's mouth over here? So one of his friends, he took scrapings from his teeth. He compared them. He also compared it to someone who, as it's quoted in the paper, someone who is known to imbibe in alcohol. And he was curious if there would, there would be a difference or not. Then he compared it to somebody who, um, he took scrapings from someone's teeth, who, as it's described, had not brushed their teeth in three weeks. And he was curious what he would find there. Now, as a microbiologist, I can tell you, oh, I'm sure he found lots of stuff there. You know, as as a mother, I'm like, ooh, the yuck factor, I'm sure he found stuff there. So anyway, he did all these comparisons as he collected all this information because he would draw what he saw and would describe it in very uh, great detail. He ended up uh, comparing composing it into different papers. In the first paper, he he's wrote it up and he sent it off to the Royal Academy of Science in London, which was kind of like the big place at the time to get published, to say, you know, look at this. Look what I've found. Now, you have to understand, from a historical standpoint, this time period, number one, there's a lot of nationalistic pride, which, I mean, there still is today. Uh, but there's also was a lot of um, big egos, which there is today still too, to some degree. Basically, he, he submitted his manuscript and the members of the Royal Academy of Science, I mean, number one, they look at it and you have to understand, these are things that have never been seen before. So they're thinking, what is, what is this man doing? I mean, he acts like he's crazy. And then they're like, well, he wasn't trained. What's his background? He's a tailor. He hasn't been trained in the sciences. He didn't go to Oxford and he didn't go to Cambridge. And, and I mean, some of them, frankly, can, like I say, have big egos. And they're like, why would we listen to this man? I mean, I have a degree. He doesn't. And, uh, so they ignored him. And then he would resubmit it or would submit a new paper. And they're like, oh, it's that crazy Dutchman again. You know, he's not, he's not English. He's not trained. He didn't go to Oxford. And, and so this went back and forth. Um, and I have to say he was very persistent and that he kept submitting papers even though they were rejected. 
uh, he continued looking and expanding, you know, samples of what he looked at. And he, he, he had that curiosity, that natural curiosity that we love to see uh, in scientists. It's that curiosity that children often have that unfortunately we kind of squash as you get older. But how is this here? Why is that there? Hey, does this look different over here? I found a sample in this water over here in the creek. I wonder what I would find in the soil. I wonder what I would find on my bread, etc. And so... Um, he did keep very meticulous notes and drew what he saw. I will say this from some of his drawings today we can look at and get an idea of what it was that he saw. Maybe not down to species level, but it gives us an idea of, oh, this was a fungus or this was uh, a protosalin. Or yeah, this might have been a large bacteria, etc. Uh, like I said, he, he was a tailor. Now, he continued working in that chosen field of his and, and did this on the side. He kept submitting papers, and like I said, they kept rejecting him. And that's unfortunately what we often see. And over time, you know, if you keep working on something and somebody keeps telling you you're crazy and this is stupid and you don't know what you're talking about, you know, after a while that, that tends to wear you down. And unfortunately, that's what happened with him. And he actually became very bitter. He felt very strongly that, yes, he was seeing these organisms, and this was something new, and everybody else in the world should know about this. And it gets frustrating when no one listens to you. So he became very bitter. And obviously the microscopes that he made, he had to make by hand. And so the lens for the, it was a simple microscope, so it just had one lens to it. The lens that he, he would grind to make that lens, he became very almost like paranoid and distrustful of people. And so he never taught that skill to anyone else. Um, you know, when everyone's telling you you're crazy, you start to become very distrustful. You're going to keep certain things secret and, and not train anyone, which was very unfortunate. And... Another thing that happened, which we have seen in not only science, but a lot of various disciplines over the years, is that someone who makes a huge contribution to that field, it's not recognized during their lifetime. It's not until later that we realize, you know what, they weren't crazy. They were well ahead of their time. Look at what they did. And that's what happened with, with Von Leeuwenhoek. Uh, it was not until after his death that people started to realize and somebody, you know, well, let me look, look into what he was talking about. Let me see here. And, and then they started to realize, um, hey, he, he was right. You know, he, he knew what he was talking about here. It doesn't matter that he wasn't trained at one of the big name universities. He he had this natural instinct, and he was very good at recording things. But this man knew what he was talking about. But as I said, he never taught anyone how to uh, grind the lenses, make those lenses for his simple microscopes. Um, it has been said that to this day, no one has been able to hand make. Obviously, we can with machines make the lenses, but by hand, nobody has been able to duplicate to the precision and accuracy, the lenses that he made. And it just kind of, at least for me, makes me stop and wonder, had people listened to him, where might we be in the field of microbiology and possibly other fields if things had not been essentially delayed before somebody finally realized, hey, this man knew what he was talking about. And had he taught that trade to someone, would we be further along? Of course, we can't change the past, but um, it's just kind of an, an interesting thing uh, I feel sometimes to, to look at. And it's, it is a common thing, as I said, not only in science, but in other fields, where sometimes some of these major contributions, when you go back and look at it, at the time that the person discovered it or uh, voiced, here's uh, something of interest, they're not listened to with any seriousness during their lifetime. So this is a, a picture showing von Leeuwenhoek. 
And here is um, what the type of microscope. It's so simple, just one lens. Uh, but it, this is an example of what it looked like. So in microbiology, we're obviously looking at things that you cannot see with the unaided eye. You need to have some type of means of magnifying so you can see what you're looking at. And here this looking at some algae. We have a way of classifying. You're, you're going to find out in microbiology, which is like the uh, general biology, we love to organize things. We want everything to fit in nice little groups. And so how do we classify the microbes or microorganisms? Well, Carlos Linnaeus developed a taxonomic system for naming plants and animals and how you group similar animals together. Um, you'll find that we use a similar system with microorganisms. In microbiology, we tend to look or classify things into one of six main groups to start off with, uh, broad categories of what we look at. And that would be the, bar uh, the bacteria, the archaea, the fungi, protozoans, algae, and then very small multicellular animals that you can only see using a microscope. Basically, if you can't see it with the uh, naked eye, that's what we study. Um, I used to always kind of laugh with my kids as they were growing up and, and say, if it's big enough that you can see it, I don't study it, unless it's the human body. I, I do uh, a lot of work there. So how, once again, do you classify these six groups? Bacteria and the archaea, and throughout the semester, we will look in other chapters in much greater detail, each of these, but just for a quick summary here. Bacteria and the archaea, they're uh, single cells, so they're unicellular. They do not have a nucleus. They are much smaller than the eukaryotic cells. They're both what we call prokaryotic cells. They're found just about everywhere. Um, they can be found on land and water and air. They can be found deep subsurface, uh, the ocean vents where there's very high pressure, very low light, well, no light at all. They're, they can be found at 35,000 feet up in the air and everywhere in between. They can be found in very extreme environments, very low pH, very high salt concentrations. Areas where you think there is nothing that can survive in here. Well, you might be surprised. They reproduce asexually. Uh, the bacteria, a few bacteria do not have a cell wall. Most of them do. When they have a cell wall, it contains the chemical peptidoglycan. That is unique to bacteria. The archaea cell walls are not composed of peptidoglycan. Instead, they're composed of other polymers. And that's one way that we use to distinguish between the two. In this uh, drawing, in this, this picture of a cheek cell, there's actually two cheek cells. You can see that uh, kind of brownish tan, dark tan color. That's the nucleus in the, uh, each of the, the two eukaryotic cheek cells. And then the prokaryotic bacterial cells are those little tiny rods that are there. Now they can be different shapes, but in this case they look like little rods that are inside a cell. This is giving you a size comparison. Uh, they are very uh, small. Uh, like I said, they can be little rods, they can be uh, little spheres, little circles that can be connected in chains, etc. Uh, so the bacteria and archaea are much, much simpler, much, much smaller than uh, eukaryotic cells. Animal cells, such as all of your cells, are eukaryotic cells. Fungi, they are eukaryotic, so they are going to be larger than the bacteria and the archaea. They do have a nucleus in them. Fungi will obtain their food source from other organisms. They can't make their own. They do have a cell wall. The composition of their cell walls is going to be made out of chitin. Uh, fungi include molds and yeast. Mold tends to be uh, multicellular. So you often have them growing in these long filaments. They look like these long chains with several cells connected together. And then they can produce spores. Yeast is single cell. And they will reproduce by what we call budding. 
And this picture shows an A that is mold. You can see what's known as the hyphae. That is uh, a strand with cells connected together. And then on the tips of the hyphae is where you have the spore formation. And so you can see those yellow round circles. Those are the fungal spores. So it's definitely multicellular. Uh, the picture is seen in B. These are uh, yeast. And what you see are the budding. That's the way the ye individual yeast cell will uh, reproduce. So you have this, this clump of yeast there. Just so you know, these are taken. SEM is the scanning electron micrograph. And so the size is uh, obviously much, much smaller as compared to, uh, say, the cheek cell we saw previously. Protozoans are eukaryotes, they're single cell. Uh, protozoans are similar to animals in the way they get their nutrients and the way they look. Most of them are living in water or in a host. Um, protozoans are they're similar to animals, but they're oftentimes uh, they're a huge category where some of us would go, uh, we don't know where to put this, so what do we do with it? Well, we'll put it in the protozoans. Like I said, they are single cell. Uh, most of them are able to move by various forms of locomotion. They may have pseudopods, which is where there's an extension of the cell. It kind of flows out in a direction and kind of wraps around what it wants. Cilia are little uh, protrusions, little hair like protrusions, that as they move, they're going to help move the organism. And the flagella is a very long. Uh, extension from the cell. So on the top figure you have uh, all of these are protozoans. You have one that has the pseudopods. Uh, this way amoebas will move and those extensions will just kind of flow and then the rest of the cell follows. They're attracted to different chemicals etc and that's how they're moving. In B you can see the cilia which are the little, they look like little hair, little extensions off from the cell and then flagella on the bottom in figure C. Uh, usually there's just one or two. They're very long as compared to the cilia. But that will also help propel the cell through its environment. Algae, uh, depending on the ones that you're looking at, there's, there's different types of algae. Some are unicellular, some are multicellular. Now, algae are photosynthetic, so from that standpoint, they are similar to plants in that they can take solar energy and sunlight and convert it into chemical energy. So they, they make their own food. They have very simple reproductive uh, structures, and they do have a cell wall. They will be classified according to the composition of the cell wall and the pigment that is being produced. Some algae are red, some are brown, some are green, and so they will be classified according to not only the cell wall but the pigmentation present. So here uh, is some pictures, representative pictures of algae. On A is what most people think of when they think of algae, and then on B, obviously, you've got lots of different uh, shapes and sizes of these organisms. Now, there are other organisms that uh, microbiologists will look at, which are also too small to be seen with the naked eye, so that's why we, we will look at them, and that's both parasites and viruses. So this is a picture. <clears throat> Excuse me, you have a slide with the red blood cells, and then you can very easily see that there is a worm uh, present in this individual's blood, and you would not be able to see that with the naked eye. So, say someone, you know, you take a blood sample and you're looking at it. A microbiologist needs to be trained not only to be identifying different abnormalities with the blood, but obviously, <laughs> this is not supposed to be there. And then this is a color enhanced uh, picture, but it's showing viruses with a bacterium. Uh, this particular virus is a type that will infect bacteria. And you can see the one at the, the top, which is labeled that it is uh, attached to the cell. It's about ready to inject its nucleic acid into the cell. There are already viral particles inside the cell. Um, 
which basically the virus is reproducing, making new vir viral particles. Just to let you know, there are still uh, two different schools of thought about viruses as to whether or not they are living. Some people think of them as living entities. They're not really a cell per se. A virus essentially is composed of a protective cell coat that's um, made out of protein and inside is uh, nucleic acid. It's either DNA or RNA. That's pretty much it. Some people have belonged to a school of thought that say that yes, viruses are living. They can react to environment. They uh, respond to different stimuli. <coughs> Excuse me. They uh, reproduce. So they do have these char basic characteristics that we, in biology we feel that all living things have. There's another school of thought that says, okay, yes, that's true. They respond to different things in their environment. However, they reproduce, but they cannot reproduce on their own. A virus can only reproduce in a host cell. And so because it can't reproduce on its own, if there's no host cell, it's never going to reproduce. From that standpoint, then they should not be classified as living because they can't reproduce on their own. And then the first school of thought says, well, all we say in biology is that a living thing must be able to reproduce. We don't say how, we don't say when, we just say it needs to be able to reproduce. And so they go back and forth. So that is up to you to decide by, after looking at the information, weighing both sides to see how you feel about it. Uh, one is not right, one is not wrong. There's just two different um, schools of thought on that. There was a period in microbiology that we refer to as the golden age of microbiology. This is when a lot of uh, major fundamental discoveries were made that helped to advance this field. What was happening? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, scientists were starting to question a lot of different things that kind of been held for long periods of time. And the four main questions they were looking at was um, does spontaneous generation occur with microorganisms. Now you have to understand the time period uh, that this is occurring in. Um, that in general, the scientific community initially did believe that spontaneous generation occurred. So the thought was, well, if that's occurring with other forms of life, does this happen with the microorganisms as well? It kind of, you know, where do they fit in? Do they behave the same as other life forms. They were also curious about what causes fermentation to occur relative to the wine industry. They, there is a huge outbreak. What causes disease? We know we have these different diseases. What's the causative agent? And then how do we prevent disease and infections from occurring? So I said in terms of this uh, spontaneous uh, generation occur with microorganisms, um, the general rule of thought was that they knew that life, uh, different life forms could be uh, reproduced in various methods. They knew sexual reproduction, asexual reproduction, and then they thought it came from non-living matter. Aristotle was the one who first proposed spontaneous generation, that living things could arise from non-living matter. And where did this idea come from? Well, part of it came from, once again, you have to understand from a historical perspective of what happened at the time. This is before electricity, so it's before refrigeration. And so, you know, people had noticed, man, I, you know, um, we butchered our cow, we've got the meat out, and then, oh, look at the meat. Well, you know the cow's dead because you butchered it. But after a while, it's like, oh, there's, there's maggots in the meat. Well, they must have come from the meat. They just arose there. They never put together the fact that maybe the flies that were landing on the meat, you know, the previous days deposited the eggs, and now you've got the maggots there. Um, so 
there was someone ready who did some experiments, started to question, like, eh, some of this doesn't make sense to me. So he did some very basic experiments, um, kind of testing Aristotle's theory. And it was a very simple um, experiment and where he had a container and you put meat raw meat in there if it's uncovered guess what flies surprise surprise are going to come in and several days later you have maggots there and then the spot they you know grow and then you, you have the flies well what he did is he took a container he said well what happens he started to say maybe the flies are depositing eggs or something on there that it's coming from the flies. It's not coming from the meat itself that, that you get these maggots. So what if we put the meat in a container, but we could seal it? And that's what he did. There were no maggots. And then some people said, well, if you seal a container, it's not getting this. Uh, we feel that in the air, there's this life-giving process in the air that's necessary. So he said, okay. Then I'll take a container, I'll put the meat in it. Now I'm going to cover it with some cotton gauze. That way the air can get in, but not the flies. Because as I said, he was an observant man. He suspected it was the flies. And as you can guess, yes, the meat in the jar uh, did not develop maggots because the flies couldn't get into it. So this was a famous experiment. It may seem very simple now. And a lot of you may be thinking, well, yes, of course. Okay, we're not talking uh, current times. We're talking hundreds of years ago that they did this experiment. Um, and you kind of have to understand what the general thought process was at that time. So pretty much he disproved Aristotle's uh, theory on spontaneous generation. Uh, there were additional um, experiments that were done because some people said, okay, so... Uh, flies do not spontaneously regenerate, but what about microorganisms? And so they did some additional experiments. Um, there were several different people who did things with taking uh, like a broth type solution and trying to see can things uh, grow out of it if you don't purposely inoculate them. Um, and the, Somebody would do an experiment, get part way in proving something, and then somebody else would say, yeah, but you know what, you didn't look at this variable, or you didn't do this right. And then you'd have another person, well, let me see if I can try to go ahead and um, improve upon it. And they were often looking at sealed versus non-sealed containers. And as I said, some people said, you know, there may not be enough air. Once you seal it, if they use up all the air, you have a different process here that's that's not working right. And then along came Louis Pasteur, who's a French scientist. And <coughs> he is credited with many, many different things in the field of microbiology. And so he finally designed an experiment that once and for all put an end to this idea of spontaneous generation for microorganisms. What he did is he took a flask, and instead of just a normal flask, the the neck of it, the the skinny upper portion of it, he had uh, someone make them special where they're curved. They describe them as being a swan neck. Uh, so the flask remains upright. Uh, you can make your broth solution, put it in there, heat it up to boiling. And then just leave the flask out and see what happens. Um, if dust comes in the mouth of the flask, because of this kind of swan, almost U-shaped, the dust, anything is going to settle at the bottom of that U. Now, what he found was that if you uh, tilt the flask, so the dust can move into the broth solution. Within a day, the broth solution is going to be cloudy. Bacteria, when they grow in a liquid solution, it will turn it cloudy, or what we call turbid. So Pasteur, uh, this is a picture of what those flasks look like. So he would boil the solution, let it sit, um, 
as you can see, air can easily move in and out so that quote unquote life force that people were concerned that you're restricting is no longer restricted. Air can easily move in and out. Uh, but that bottom of that U shape is where dust would collect. Like I say, if you tip the flask and allow the dust to get into the broth, it would become contaminated within usually 24 hours. Some of these flasks that he had several of them that he set up, that as long as you do not tip that flask, the that broth infusion sits there and uh, it never becomes uh, contaminated. I can remember reading once that they have one of his flasks in one of the museums in France that has amazingly survived all of, you know, um, these years and um, we're talking about in the uh, 1800s has survived the world wars was not destroyed and that at least one of those flasks is still there obviously has never been uh, altered as far as the opening of that flask so it's still open and that that infusion that broth is still sterile so this put an end to that discussion that no spontaneous generation does not occur with microorganisms. Now, through all of this, as I said, there were different people who were looking to disprove and then they found that, oh, there's, there's different um, problems with the design of different experiments. And a lot of this led to what is known as the scientific method, which basically say, Scientists, we are like the little two-year-olds that never grew up. We're constantly like, well, why? How does this occur? Why? So the first step of the scientific method is that you've been making observations, and that leads to some question, whether it's a why or how or when. And from that question, then you're going to generate a hypothesis. A hypothesis is simply an educated guess. You're trying to figure out, well, you know, I think this is happening because of X, Y, Z. So the first step of the scientific method is observation. The second step is you're going to generate uh, or make your hypothesis. The third step is that you are going to actually now test that hypothesis by doing an experiment. The third step, you're going to get uh, your result, or fourth step, excuse me, you get your results from your experiment. They're either going to prove or disprove your hypothesis. And what we have found is that uh, it's actually easier to disprove a hypothesis. I know that sounds strange, but it's, it's actually easier. And as with anything, you ask a question, you go through the experiments, you get results, you either prove or disprove your hypothesis, but oftentimes one question, you get an answer to it, either yes or no, might lead then to 20 new questions. And so we never stop asking. And part of what the never stop asking question also deals with never stop observing what's around you. Notice what's going on. And then kind of let that, uh, that curiosity come back to you that you had a, as a kid. Of, well, wait a minute. Why is this happening here? Why does that happen there? And so, like I say, the scientific method, it, it's kind of a standard way of Everyone following a certain pattern. The one thing with experiments, uh, for years I did do experiments and have published papers, etc. And I often add work or it's volunteered position basically I'm asked oftentimes to review manuscripts that are in my specialty area that people have submitted for publication. And one thing that I find, uh, especially people who have just for starting out in research, a mistake that they will make is in the experimental stage. Make sure that you have a control group. Make sure that you are only testing for one variable at a time. If you want to see what is the effect of something, well, don't change the temperature and the pH and the carbon source all at once, because if there is a change, you won't know which it is. Years ago, we used to use an example of um, a light bulb. You grab a light bulb and it doesn't work. 
That's your observation. So your question would be, why isn't the light, the flashlight working? Well, you can make a hypothesis and say the battery is dead. You could also make a hypothesis uh, that uh, the example we used to use was that the light bulb had burnt out. In my household, a third example would be who took the batteries out of the light bulb to use in something else. Now, any one of those three would be your hypothesis. To do your experiment, would you uh, to take, basically, would you change out the batteries? Now, the example in the book that we used would talk about, would you change the light bulb? Personally, I don't know anybody who changes the light bulb in a uh, flashlight because you just go to a store and buy one for a dollar. But we'll just use this example anyway, so bear with me. Would you change the light bulb and the batteries at the same time? If you did, and then you turned on the flashlight, and ooh, it works. Well, what was the original problem? You don't know because you changed two different things. You don't know which one of the uh, issues was the problem. Was it the batteries or was it the light bulb? So you only change one at a time. Now, you might be thinking it could be one of either of those problems. So like I said, in my household, the first thing you would do is open up, are there batteries there? If there are batteries, okay, that rules out. You just disproved that hypothesis that maybe somebody took the batteries. You disproved it. So now you go back, okay, the flashlight's still not working, so let's go to another hypothesis. Well, maybe the batteries are dead. So leave the light bulb alone and swap out the batteries. If the flashlight works, great. Now you're able to say, okay, we can accept this hypothesis that the batteries were dead. That was the problem. If it still doesn't work, then you can say, okay, I think it might be the light bulb. And then you go from there. Now in research, it, once you have basically answered your questions, that's when you're going to write things up in a paper and then try to publish it. Back to the golden age of microbiology, one of the other questions is what's causing fermentation? Uh, in Europe, in this time period, there's a problem where oftentimes the winemakers, their wine was um, getting spoiled. I mean, they were producing the wine, all of a sudden it would get spoiled. And it's like, okay, this is threatening our whole industry. What's going to happen uh, if we can't figure out? If you're having problems with the wine spoiling and you don't know what the problem is, then how can you fix the problem? So they were asking for help. Uh, and this was occurring both in France and in uh, Germany. So they were asking for government help. And they ran through a whole series of tests. And Pasteur finally was able to say, okay, we know what... It's happening now with fermentation. Uh, without enough oxygen, organisms will switch to a fermentation process. And some of this can lead to spoilage of certain things such as wines. So he developed a method of pasteurization, which is not sterilizing things, but it's just heating liquid up enough where it will kill most of the bacteria. This was the beginning of industrial microbiology, which is a huge field now of where you use microorganisms to produce certain products of interest that you want. So Pasteur started that. This is a list of various foods and beverages and products uh, which essentially are made by microorganisms. There was another individual, Bushner, who also was working with some of the fermentation problems and found that there are certain enzymes that will help uh, promote or assist chemical reactions. And basically, from his work is where we now have the current uh, modern field of biochemistry. So looking at uh, not necessarily the organism, but what's the chemical process that is occurring. So as they started to make these different discoveries, then governments started saying, okay, um, we have this particular disease, this illness, 
what's causing it? And so in this age of microbiology, there's a very interesting thing that started to happen. You had Louis Pasteur in France, and he developed the germ theory of disease, saying that diseases are caused by a particular microorganism. And so if you could figure out what microorganism it was that caused the disease, so you could say uh, bacteria A causes disease A, once you know what the causative agent is, then you can look at controlling bacteria A and thereby prevent disease A from ever occurring. How do you prevent a disease if you don't know what the cause of it is? And so uh, he was funded, Pasteur was funded by the French government to start looking at various diseases at this time where there were outbreaks to try to find out what is the causative agent so we can control the disease and de decrease the incidence of the particular diseases. Robert Koch was a German scientist and he started uh, studying in this area as well. And so uh, between the two, they really went back and forth and found out what the causative agents were of multiple diseases. And it's, it was also at a time period of very strong nationalistic pride. So the French were like, uh, if Robert Koch developed, discovered something, then the French government was like, here, Louis Pasteur, you're our star scientist. We need you to find uh, something. Don't let that German guy you know, beat us at this. So they would give him money. Well, then the Germans were doing the same thing, telling Robert Cook, well, you don't want Pasteur and that, that French guy to beat us on this. So it was kind of like a race back and forth. And from a scientist standpoint, it led to huge discoveries. It was also kind of an interesting time in that the science was so well supported by the respective governments. It's kind of like, man, oh, you mean the government's just kind of throwing money at us? Isn't this nice? So the result was, in the field of microbiology, this huge advancement. So this is Robert Koch. He uh, said between he and Pasteur, they did find the causative agent of many different diseases. Something that Koch did, he also developed some very simple staining techniques to allow you to see the microorganisms. He took the first photograph of a bacteria. He took the first photograph of a bacteria in diseased tissue. He developed techniques for how do you estimate the number of bacteria in a solution. They're so small you can't see them, so how do you know how many are there? He developed the technique for estimating that. Uh, he realized that to sterilize your growth media, he used steam. He was the first person to use Petri dishes. Can you imagine? Not having, I mean, we're so used to now having petri dishes and growing thing on the solid iron. I'll just look at the petri dish. He was the first one to do that. He developed the techniques that we use in the lab for transferring bacteria. And he was the first one to propose that bacteria should, as a distinct species. So this is showing several different bacteria growing on a solid medium on auger in a petri dish. And as you can see, there's multiple different species here. How do I know that? You can tell that by looking at just number one. There's different colors, different sizes, different shapes of them. Some of them uh, are nice and round in shape. Uh, look how nice and round that bacteria is between bacteria 6 and bacteria 7. And compare that to, say, bacteria 10, which does not have a nice smooth round margin on it. Uh, you have different colors from white to beige to yellow. And then look at bacteria 8 that has uh, kind of a ring in part of the structure as well. Robert Koch also developed what is known as Koch's postulates. These are four different steps that Initially, what he developed and felt that must be followed in order to say organism A causes disease A. He developed these uh, postulates, these methods as we all need to be following the uh, same type of rule of how we determine what is a causative agent of what disease. And so these four postulates are, number one, the suspected agent, causative agent, must be found in every case 
of the disease. So every individual that has the disease must have this. We must be able to isolate this agent from them. And it must be absent in the healthy host. So if, if you're not sick, you, you don't have it there. Once you've isolated from an uh, individual who is sick, who is showing the signs of that disease, you must be able to isolate that particular agent and grow it outside the host. That agent must be introduced to a healthy, susceptible host, and then that host then will uh, get sick and show the disease symptoms. And then you must be able to recover that agent from that, that diseased experimental host. So it must be found in every case of infected individual. You must be able to isolate it, introduce it then into a healthy individual, and that healthy individual must then develop the disease and you re-isolate that uh, causative agent from that person. Now, I will say this before we move on. There have been some changes with Koch's postulates. Yes, we still follow it. We still use that as our guide. But there are times when you may not be able to fulfill all four of the steps. The ones that you may not be able to fulfill, uh, the, the most worrisome ones are to infect a healthy individual. If there is no known cure for the disease, then obviously from an ethical standpoint, you cannot infect a healthy individual when there is no known cure for it. <coughs> if there's no known cure, you cannot and should not even cross your mind to ask someone to volunteer to be a host and try this out. There are a couple of cases where uh, we have been able to determine that, say, a particular bacteria is a causative agent of a disease, even though we have not been able to grow it in pure culture. Uh, one example of that is the bacteria that causes leprosy. We've been able to isolate the bacteria from everyone who uh, has been diagnosed as having leprosy. We know what this bacteria is because we've been able to isolate it every single time. We can take the bacteria and we can infect another animal host and see manifestations of the disease, but we cannot to this day grow that bacteria in pure culture. And so there's been enough Sometimes you can get enough evidence to say, okay, look, we are confident that this is the causative agent, even though we weren't quite able to fulfill all of Koch's postulates. This table is showing a list of several of the different scientists that were working during this time period that's referred to as the golden age of microbiology when so many advancements were being made, uh, like say, it was in this time period, not only Pasteur and Koch, but others who were discovering what causative agents of various diseases were, um, and just making, like I say, these tremendous advancements in the field of microbiology. Now, when you look at bacteria, um, yes, they're nice and colored in your textbook, but that's not the way they look in reality. And they're so small, you obviously, as we've said, you use a microscope to see them. But they're colors. You're not going to see them without some type of a stain. And so the Graham stain is the most basic fundamental stain that you will use in microbiology. It was developed by Graham. Uh, and it is the first thing that you will do when you're working with bacteria, certainly to identify the bacteria. All bacterial uh, respond, well, most of them respond to the gram stain. There's a few that won't. But all the bacteria are going to be first classified according to what they're, re, how they respond to the gram stain. We refer to them as either being gram positive or gram negative. And this is a, a picture showing uh, the results of a gram stain. The gram positive ones are going to look kind of a purplish blue color and the gram negatives will look red. The difference has to do with the differences in the composition of the cell wall of the bacteria. 
And why is this so important? We'll be stressing over and over about gram positive versus gram negative, is that because of the differing chemical compositions of their cell wall, they will respond differently to things like antibiotics. So that's one reason why, uh, say in the healthcare field, you need to know if someone has a bacterial infection, what is the causative agent? Is it gram positive or gram negative? That gives you a clue as to how you're going to treat them. Do you prescribe penicillin or not? So how do we prevent, this other question was, how do we prevent infection? How do we prevent disease from occurring? There are, once again, a lot of different individuals who made advancements. You know, some of them now you might take as just common sense. Uh, things like hand washing, antiseptic technique, uh, huge advancements in the field of nursing trying to control infections in the field of epidemiology, of following, okay, well, if this person is infected, who have they come in contact with? So we need to make sure that they're not infecting others. Edward Jenner's uh, development of vaccines helped with the whole field of immunology, and then advancements uh, developing into the field of chemotherapy. So you have Florence Nightingale, and you have... Um, a lot of these individuals who are listed on the left-hand side and how it has advanced or developed into these modern uh, subcategories within uh, biology and microbiology, the sciences, um, how they have uh, basically helped with the formation and the advancement of these fields. In terms of the field of microbiology, it's a huge area. Most people tend to think, oh, microbiology, ew, germs. And they think just of medical field. But there's a lot of things that are included in the field of microbiology. Uh, you can specialize in bacteriology, where you're mainly just studying bacteria and or the archaeus. You can look at phycology, where you just study algae. Mycology is studying the fungi. Virology is studying viruses. You may be looking more at, instead of the individual organism, what about the metabolism or the genetics? Or environmental microbiology. There's food microbiology, industrial microbiology, uh, microbial ecology. And so there's a huge, huge umbrella, if you will, that is uh, included under the title of microbiology. You can get very specific. There is applied microbiology. You can look at medical microbiology. You can look at applied environmental, bioremediation, where you're using microorganisms to clean up pollutants. Uh, as I said, you've got things like food microbiology, pharmaceutical microbiology, where you're using microorganisms to help make antibiotics help make vaccines so it's a huge huge uh, field with many many subcategories what are some of the basic chemical reactions necessary for life biochemistry um, Pasteur worked with this so did Buchner um, how does this relate to uh, microbiology in terms of the chemical reactions you can use microorganisms in a lot of practical applications. You can use them to help design pesticides. You can use biochemical reactions for helping to diagnose illnesses, monitor a patient's response, for treatment of various diseases, for designing new drugs. How do genes work? This is studied in the field of microbial genetics, molecular biology, recombinant DNA technology, and gene therapy. So with microbial genetics, there have been several different people over the years who have worked, number one, that were able to first determine that genes, where are they? Because for a while it was thought, are they on proteins? No, it was found that they are on molecules of the DNA. Uh, and then later it was determined, okay, so the gene is, is in the DNA, but the gene is controlling, contains the information on how to make the proteins. And structure determines function. So once you have information on the structure of the protein, and then it goes into its 3D shape and it can now function properly. Uh, 
work was use, using microorganisms to help uh, discover the methods of translation, which is protein synthesis. Uh, we've looked at a lot of different uh, mechanisms for uh, how chemical reactions are occurring, how mutations happen, uh, how are genes expressed, when are they turned on, when are they turned off. Molecular biology is looking at things at the molecular level within the cell. Uh, how are proteins being made, etc. Um, recombinant DNA technology. This is when you're taking DNA from one organism and you manipulate it for a practical application. You may place it in a different organism. You uh, things an example is taking uh, human growth hormone, taking that gene, putting it into E. coli, which is a bacteria, and have the E. coli uh, produce the human growth hormone that now can be purified and given to individuals who have a deficiency in it. Same thing for uh, producing insulin for someone who's diabetic get the bacteria that can grow so fast. And, and that's one of the reasons sometimes people say, well, why would you put a human gene into a bacteria and have the bacteria make that protein product? And the reason is bacteria like E. coli has been very well studied. Under optimum conditions, E. coli will reproduce every 18 minutes. So you can get a lot of it really quickly. E. coli is very cheap and easy to grow. So your overhead expense is very low and you can very quickly get lots of your product. Gene therapy is the field that has been uh, studied more recently in terms of can you uh, take a gene and insert it into someone who's missing that gene or has a defective one as a means of treating the disease. How do microorganisms play a role in the environment? They're huge uh, contributors to keeping a nice healthy environment. From practical applications, the field of bioremediation uses bacteria or fungi to help clean up basically spills either in the water, in the soil. So they have the microorganisms naturally clean up uh, an area. Microorganisms do play a huge role with recycling carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, etc. Serology is a specialized field where you're, you're looking at the blood and studying uh, what components are in there, uh, antibodies, etc. Immunology is a specialized field where you look at the body's immune response to specific organisms. And chemotherapy is using chemicals to help treat things. Uh, probably the most well-known one is Fleming's discovery of penicillin, which is an antibiotic which is made naturally by a fungus. So this is showing the fungus on the plate, the upper portion, the nice white, that is penicillium, and it secretes the penicillin, that antibiotic, and you get that zone of inhibition. You can see that area around it where there's no growth, and the bacteria that is growing on here is the genus uh, Staphylococcus, and as you can see, the penicillin does inhibit the growth of it. So where does microbiology stand in this modern age? We are continuing to ask those questions. We're still the two-year-olds asking how, how, why, where. Uh, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. For every question you ask, there's going to be 20 more questions. These are various quotes over the years that I've heard, and, and they are true. Um, so that, you know, for every question we ask, okay, we get the answer there, but you don't stop. You just keep moving and answering uh, more questions and looking into more things. So don't ever squash that curiosity. 